I even heard somebody say that when you go to heaven, you will still pay tithe. It means in heaven, you will still give tithes. And it was to Melchizedek that Abraham gave tithes. And I hope you know Melchizedek is eternal. Was not created, cannot be destroyed. It means in heaven, you will still give tithes. Because his, priest, his priesthood remains. Can we go back to scripture? Good. It means in heaven, you will still give tithes. Because his, priest, his priesthood remains. Ele! Ele! So, which job will we do in heaven where they will pay us salary so that we can pay tithe? Hey, Jesus. Let my people... You didn't die for them. Oh. <laughs> Stop all these your superstitions. Stop all this your character assassination of the scriptures. And stop all this abuse of the Bible. Let the people go. Let them serve God. Trust the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is in people's hearts. It will move people to do what they ought to do. Trust the Holy Ghost. Even God trusts the Holy Ghost. He gave us his spirit. And he believes that his spirit will guide us to do what is right. Don't bind people with laws. Man-made laws. Doctrines of men. That makes the word of God of none effect. <laughs> Leave this thing. Leave this thing. Hebrews 10, <laughs> verse 8. <laughs> Above. <laughs> when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the Lord. God has no pleasure in anything that is coming by way of the law of Moses. Anything under the law does not give God pleasure. There's only one thing that God gives God pleasure. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So if you're going to give God pleasure, you give God pleasure in Christ. In Christ. Not in the law. He has no pleasure in anything that is offered by the law, that is taught by the law, that is done according to the law of Moses. Teaching Bible. And he's quoting from Micah chapter 6 verse 6 to 7. That's what the writer of Hebrews is quoting from. Micah 6, 6 to 7 and Psalms chapter 40 verse 6. Psalms chapter 40 verse 6. God is saying, I never ask for offering. Why will God ask for offering? When he's not the one putting man in the bondage of sin. God is not the kidnapper. So God is not, not the one demanding for offering to free man. If God was the kidnapper, then God will be the one demanding offering. Sin kidnapped man because man submitted to sin. To whom you yield your members, you become servants of. Man submitted himself to the servanthood of sin. And Jesus came as a substitute to free man from sin. And by his death, he broke the power of sin. So now when you believe the gospel, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Why? You're not under the law, but you're under the grace of God. Teaching good? Yes. Say, I'm a servant of righteousness. And a master over sin. You're a master over sin. You're a master over sin. God was telling man he was going to offer the sacrifice of sin on man's behalf. He was not demanding. That's why it is the wages of sin, not the wages of God. The wages of sin is dead. Not the wages of God. The wages of sin is dead. Sin demands death. And the gift that God gives is eternal life, which breaks the power of sin. So what God gives is eternal life. What sin demands is death. God died the death 
to offer man a gift of eternal life without conditions. Not the wages of God. The wages of sin. So the distortion in knowledge. The distortion in knowledge. Made them give the offering of physical blood to God. And made God responsible for the bondage. You didn't hear that. Let me repeat because you need to keep that line somewhere. The distortion in knowledge. Made them give the offering of physical blood to God. And made him responsible for the bondage. Whereas he was the one taking care of the sin. It was God that was taking care of the sin. So year by year they were bringing sacrifices. <laughs> As if it was God that was keeping them in bondage. A misrepresentation of God's character. Every time they brought that animal blood. They were carrying out a character assassination on God. Every time they brought that blood, they were bringing a character assassination on God. I did a podcast that just came out last week. I've actually done a few podcasts and they're all over the place. You can check them up on YouTube. I did one in Nigeria. I did one in South Africa. And one of the guys asked me an intelligent question. He said, in idol worship, idols demand human sacrifice and animal sacrifice. In our traditional worship, animal and, blood and, animal and human sacrifice are normal. Then when we come to Christianity... We see human sacrifice in Christianity. So what is the difference between the God of the Bible and our idols and our traditional worship? So I said to him, so it seems. He said, okay, okay, so it seems. I said, because the first time man sins in the Garden of Eden, the first sin of man, man went into hiding. God shows up and says, Adam, where are thou? Adam, where are thou? And Adam says, I'm naked. God said, come out, where are you? Adam shows up. God didn't ask for any animal sacrifice. Rather, God took the skin of an animal and covered man, demanding nothing from man. The first sin in the whole of human race, God is still covering a sinner, demanding nothing from him. Rather, pointing him back to the way of life. A flaming sword of fire, telling man, that, that is the way, that tree, that tree, which is a type of Jesus, will be your freedom from this sin. God demands nothing. The second scene in the Bible, Cain kills Abel. God didn't ask for any human sacrifice. He said, Cain is complaining, oh God, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Oh God, anybody that sees me, he will kill me, oh God. And God in his compassion took a stone and put a mark on Cain and said, anybody that touches Cain, I will deal with you. How can God be protecting a murderer yet demanding nothing? God demands nothing from a sinner because he will supply what the sinner needs to be free from sin. So the gospel does not demand. The gospel supplies. It is called the word of faith which we preach. The gospel demands nothing. The gospel only supplies what man will need. The gospel supplies what man will need. You must know Jesus beyond superstition. You must know him exactly for who he is in the pages of the scriptures. So he says in verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 10, watch this. Hebrews 10, 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Question. What was not his will? His will was that they were bringing sacrifices. He had no delight in those sacrifices. What was his will? He will offer the sacrifices himself. His will is that he will be the offerer. He will be the sacrifice. He demands nothing from the sinner. Rather, he supplies the sinner. I'm teaching good. Pay attention. So in burnt offerings, I don't want Hebrews chapter 10 verse 8 to 10. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 8 to 10. Above when he said sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offering for sin, that would is not, neither has pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Next verse. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. He taketh away the first, 
the law that he may establish the finished work of Christ, the testament of Christ. Look at the next verse. Woo, verse, verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified. That's the will of God. Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How many times? Once and for. You are saved how many times? You are sanctified how many times? You are justified how many times? You are washed how many times? You are accepted how many times? You receive the Holy Ghost how many times? Once. Everything that came by that one sacrifice came once. It came once. The point is here, look at how many years they were misrepresenting God in offering sacrifices. So a man can be in Christianity serving the wrong God for 50 years. A man can be a Christian serving a God that only exists inside his head for 40 years. Look at how many years they were serving God backwards. They thought they were serving God. And God said, no, I've never been in this thing you guys are doing. I'm not even aware you're doing anything. <laughs> That's why you should pay attention to what I'm teaching. So that you don't worship from afar. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near. No, here we don't draw. You're either worshiping from afar or you're worshiping in Christ. Superstition all over the place. Superstition all over. Look at some churches, it's just superstition, superstition. Look at some Christians, it's just superstition, superstition. Worshipping a God they don't even know. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 verse 1 to 3. Pay attention. Hebrews 9, 1 to 3. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service. Look at what he calls it. An a worldly sanctuary. <laughs> a worldly sanctuary. <laughs> Next verse. For there was a tabernacle made. The first wearing was a candlestick, table, shoe bread, which is called the sanctuary. Next verse. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So they built a worldly sanctuary and constructed it like outer court, holy place, holy of holy, which is the holiest of all. And in their mind, God was living there. So nobody entered there because they said... If you enter, you will die. So they gave a picture of a killing God. Why should I see God and die? I should see God and live. But when you are in assumption, you fear God. Because you are not sure what you will get when you approach. So you stay from afar. When you have assumptions of God that are not scriptural. That's why in the New Testament there's no teaching on the fear of God. There's no teaching because that verbiage fear of God in the Old Testament is not the same fear in your vocabulary today. So when they were saying fear of God in the Old Testament, they don't mean fear. No. It's language. So that's why in the New Testament, which is more current, nobody talks of fear. But people talk about the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. Then John will say, there is no fear in love. Perfect love cast out fear. God doesn't want you to fear him. God wants you to be confident in his love. We have known the love that God has for us. We are confident in that love. When you are afraid of your father, you will never know your father. How many of you know your father by fear? Once you hear your father coming, you run. Once you hear your father, you and your father will never have a good relationship. If you're going to have a real good relationship with your father, you must cross the barrier of fear and relate as friends. Then you and your father will get to know each other. In any relationship where there is fear, it can never be healthy. Quote me anywhere. If a relationship will be healthy, fear must be absent. Am I teaching here? Yeah. A wife that fears her husband, two of them can never gel well. A husband that fears his wife, they can never gel well. Husband and wife must go beyond fear and come to where they are naked and not ashamed. Where they are confident in one another. Then they can have a solid relationship. But once fear is introduced, then everybody begins to act like a hypocrite. Pretense comes in. You begin to hide things 
you don't say everything because fear is existing somewhere. God doesn't want you to fear him. That's why the Bible says, I will put my laws in their heart. I will write them in their minds. I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And no man shall teach anyone to know the Lord. All of them shall know me because of what I have done in their heart from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their iniquities and their sins I will remember again no more. So once that barrier is out, then you can approach God confidently. That is true worship. That is true worship. That is true worship. When he said they shall worship in spirit and in truth, that is true worship. <laughs> they built even a place inside. They call it holiest of all. That is God is there. And every year, the high priest will go in once after washing and showering and dressing and they will tie him with chain. And in the history, we never heard of one priest that died inside. Because God was never there. While they were doing all that ritual to enter the holiest, Moses was entering and coming out. One day, David and his boys were hungry. They entered in there and ate shoe bread. They entered there where the high priest should enter. David, there was not one. And his boys, to show you how useless the place was, and his boys, they entered and ate shoe bread and went free of charge. This same place that others were entering with fear. You see that? When you don't know God, when you don't know God, according to the scriptures, you have a God in your head that is not the God of the Bible. Am I teaching good? The revelation of Jesus beyond superstition. <laughs> Look at that Hebrews chapter 9. It says that while the tabernacle was standing, the Holy Ghost said, Look, there is no holiest of all here. Look at it, chapter 9 verse 7. <laughs> chapter 9 verse 7. But into the second when the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. So he offered both for himself first, to be sure he will not die inside. Next verse. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. God was not there. He has never been there in that physical building. So because something has been done for years or practiced by Christians, doesn't mean it's the will of God. Because something is popular in the Pentecostal charismatics, because something is popular in the Orthodox Church, doesn't make it God. I don't care how long the age of a lie, it doesn't make it the truth. This is Israel year by year offering sacrifices, high priest praying, yet that was in the will of God. Jesus explains God. Don't miss that. Jesus explains God. Jesus explains God. Christ is the explanation of God. Christ corrects every misconception because there were misconceptions. Christ corrects every misconception in the law. In John chapter 14 verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There are not three things. I am the way, which is the truth, which is the life. That's the way it is. It's one thing. I am the way, which is the truth, that is the life. What do you mean? No one comes to the Father except by me. What do you mean, come to the Father? It means you can't see God outside Jesus. You cannot see God outside Jesus. Any attempt to see God outside Jesus, you end up in idol worship. You can never see God outside Jesus. Jesus explains God. In verse 9 of John chapter 14, the 14th chapter of John, the ninth verse, Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And now sayest thou then, show us the Father. I am in the Father, the Father is in me. So to see me is to see the Father. Jesus 
reveals God. Look at verse 20 of John 14. Oh, glory to God. John 14, 20. At that day, you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. I'm in my Father. Ye in me, I in you. So the revelation of the church is to see God in Christ. The revelation of the church is to see God in Christ. In John 17 verse 3, this is life eternal that they may know thee the only true God. Who is the only true God? That is Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the only true God whom thou hast sent. Jesus Christ is the only true God. So eternal life means to know God in Christ. Eternal life means to know God in Christ. Look at 1 John, the 5th chapter, the 20th verse. 1 John, the 5th chapter, the 20th verse. And we know that the Son of God is come and had given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. Even in his son Jesus Christ. Who is he? This is the true God. And eternal life. So Jesus is the true God. No God outside Jesus. Jesus reveals God. If you miss Jesus, you miss God. If you miss Jesus, any opinion of God outside Christ is idol worship. Any opinion of God you have, any opinion of God you have outside Christ is idol worship. <laughs> That's the truth about God. The truth about God can only be found in his son. So every misconception in the Old Testament, every misconception, Listen carefully, Power City. Every misconception in the Old Testament from Sodom and Gomorrah, the flood of Noah, every seeming contradiction, like the scriptures we read, firewood, they kill him. Adultery, go free. Hmm? Temple, God said. New Testament, no such temple. I will give the temple. Old Testament, manna from heaven. New Testament, no manna came from heaven. Every such contradiction, even the battle of I, the man that said, when I come back, the first thing that comes out, I will offer as a sacrifice. And his child came out. He took the child and offered as a sacrifice. All those are character assassinations of God because those characters don't know God. But today, we know God in Christ. And we don't see Christ demand for any of such actions. So we know that it was not God that was demanding for any of those actions. If you miss Jesus, you miss God. So all the misconceptions, the contradictions of the Old Testament will be corrected in Christ. All the misconceptions and the contradictions of the Old Testament will be corrected in Christ. Because the characters of the Old Testament they were not God's personal revelation. Don't miss that one. The characters of the Old Testament, they were not God's personal revelation. They were third parties. The characters of the Old Testament were not God's personal revelation. They were third parties. Third party reportage. <laughs> because the character of the Old Testament, they were third parties. That is why what was most reliable, please don't miss this one, what was most reliable about their ministries were the promises they gave about Christ. What was most reliable about their ministries were the promises that they gave about Christ. So, you correct the impressions just like Jesus corrected Moses and Elijah. The Old Testament impressions of God are corrected by Christ. Just like he corrected Moses and he corrected Elijah. He will say something like, you have heard Moses said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say, don't revenge. If they slap you here, 
upon the other side. So in that statement, he's correcting Moses. Oh, he corrected them. He came to put the record straight. He came to straighten out the records. In John 5, 19, put it up for me, John chapter 5, verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he said the father do. For whatsoever he doeth, this also doeth the son likewise. The son does what the father does. So if I want to know what the father do, I look into Jesus. Whatever I see in Jesus is a revelation of the exact character and attitude of the father. So Jesus is the father manifest. Jesus is the father manifest. So Jesus is God who became a man. Jesus is God who became a man. So that there be no confusion again. Jesus is God who became a man. So that there will be no confusion again. Whatever is not found in Christ is not in God. Please don't miss that. Whatever is not found in Christ is not in God. If you miss Christ, you miss God. The moment you miss Christ in any equation, you miss God. And all the prophets ensured they prophesied about him. So you will find in the Old Testament man's distortions about God. Yes. You will see man's distortions about God in the Old Testament. Just like we saw a few. That God was trying to kill Moses. That God said, I will go down first and see whether they will obey me or not. All those are distortions. And you will find the clarification in Christ. That's why the Bible, the Old Testament, is called the book of progressive revelation. The book of progressive revelation. Not the book of epignosis, but the book of progressive revelation. If you are not careful, you will pick distortions. And those distortions will become your superstitions. If you are not careful, you will pick distortions in the Bible. And those distortions will become your, 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 your superstition. If you are not careful... If you stay with the Old Testament, you will attribute to God what Satan has done. And you will attribute to Satan what God has done. You will attribute to God what man has done. And you will deny God credit for what God has done. Yes, if you stay with the Old Testament. Except it is explained. You will end up glorifying Satan for what God has done. And glorifying God for what Satan has done. Blaming God for what man has done. I'm blessing man for what God has done. Until the scriptures are rightly divided. <laughs> you have no reason to see God as mysterious. You have no reason to see God as mysterious. Mysterious God uh -uh, is one of your distortions. God cannot be mysterious after giving you 66 books that explain him. He can no more be mysterious. Mysterious means we don't know. Uh-uh. 66 books. He doesn't only stop at the 66 books. The message of the book took up a body and became flesh and walked amongst us and we saw him. There's no more mystery about God. In Christ, God has been demystified. Yeah, in Christ, God has been demystified. Once you see Jesus, you have seen God. Glory to God. I say glory to God. Look at Colossians chapter 2 as I begin to round off. Are you blessed this morning? There's sufficient evidence in the Holy Scriptures that Jesus is God. More than enough evidence. The claims of Jesus being God overwhelms Genesis to Revelation. Overwhelms. So if the claims are true, then you have no business thinking you have the double sides of God. If Jesus is truly God, let me tell you, preachers that continue to fight to protect that God kills, don't believe in Jesus. Any preacher that is still saying, no, God kills, God kills, I can put it to you today. That preacher has not believed that Jesus is God. He's far from that revelation. Because you can't see God in Christ and say God kills. Who did Jesus kill? 
Even at the point of crucifixion, when they removed the ear of Marcos with a knife, he took it and put back. He killed nobody. At least he will have killed one person to establish that I was the one doing it all through scripture. But Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he likewise himself partook of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. John 10, 10, for the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come, that you may have life and be abundant. Any preacher that still defends that God kills is far from the revelation of God in Christ. He has not seen Christ. He hasn't seen Christ. He doesn't know Christ. That a preacher is using the name of Jesus for 30 years doesn't know he knows Jesus. The disciples were with him for three and a half years. And when he rose, they still say, we thought he was a prophet. They were even with him physically. After three and a half years, they were still not sure of who he was. So a preacher can preach Jesus for 30 years and doesn't know who Jesus is at all. No iota of him. Some say, what about the miracles that follow him? Jesus said, in that day, they shall say, in your name, I did miracles. And he will tell them, I never knew you. You did miracles, but me and, me and you never met. The miracles were my mercy because I love people. So I will do miracles anyway, but not because I know you. Miracles don't validate a preacher. Miracles are a demonstration of God's mercy. And it can happen through anybody. Any preacher that is still defending killings as God is far from Christ. What did I say? Very far. He has not even believed that Jesus is God. <laughs> and anybody that does not believe that Jesus is God is anti-Christ. This one they are calling me anti-Christ. They are the real anti-Christ. They call me heretic. They are the heretics. A man showing you Jesus, Jesus, Jesus from scripture. You call him heretic. Then you are the father of heresy. <laughs> That's why you can't see Christ. Have you ever come to this church and we preach anything other than Christ? Talk to me, have you? No. Not even by any mistake. Not even by any mistake. I don't even have stories to tell you. We don't even share testimonies. It's all Christ. From opening to closing service. True or false? So, how can a man that dwells on Christ, you call him Antichrist, you must be the father of Antichrist. You must be the father, the papa of Antichrist. One day Jesus told them, if you don't believe who I am, you shall die in your sins. He said, I say it again. You shall. This is Jesus who came to save man. But when he got to that point, he told them you will die in your sins. Leave that thing. Leave that thing. Leave that thing. Leave that thing. <laughs> Leave that thing. You say, Dr. Damina knows the Bible. It's only that he's not humble. I humble myself. I humble myself. If you don't believe that Jesus is not the killer, you are anti-Christ. I am speaking to you in a humble way. You are anti-Christ. The papa of anti-Christ. Have I spoken in humility now? I hope you receive that one. Shall I humble myself under the mighty hand of God? If after I kneel down, you're still angry, then your problem is not me being humble. Tell your neighbor, there is no double side of God. God only has a single side. Jesus. The singular fact about God is found in Christ. The singular revelation of God is found in the person of Christ. 
Give me Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. Colossians chapter 2 verse number 9. Hey. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. How? Bodily. Hey. Let me explain the word Godhead for you. It's not good English. Godhead is not Godhead. It's just, it means divinity. For in him dwelleth the fullness of divinity. Divine. Or the fullness of deity. In him dwelleth the fullness. The word fullness is the word pleroma in the Greek. Pleroma. P-L-E-R-O-M-A. The pleroma. In him dwelleth the pleroma. Complete. The fullness of divinity. Bodily. Look at the word bodily. The word bodily, there is an adver adverb used by Luke. In Luke 3.22, see the use of the word bodily. Luke 3.22. Luke chapter 3 verse 22. Put it up brother. Luke chapter 3 verse 22. <clears throat> and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son. In thee I am well pleased. So that word bodily is the word somaticos in the Greek. Soma, soma, S-O-M-A, ticus, T-I-K-U-S, somaticus. It means personally, personally. In him dwelleth the fullness of deity, personally. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, if I came, if I spoke through somebody to you, there's a way it will come different. But if I come myself, if I say, go and ask Pastor Walter to give you my car key. I came and said, Pastor Walter, Papa says, give me his car key. It's different. But when I come and I say, Walter, my car key, it, it's different. Is it different? Because I came personally. If somebody asks me, I even say, wait first, let me sign this paper, I will come. But when I show up, no matter what he's doing, he will stop and come. Because I came personally. Am I communicating at all? So, I have, Jesus is saying, I have come myself. In Jesus dwells the fullness of deity. Personally. Personally. So, the word in him dwelling the fullness of the Godhead. That's personally as opposed to a messenger. That means whatever he hasn't said has not been said. Whatever Jesus hasn't said has not been said. Whatever he hasn't done has not been done. That is God is personal in Christ. God is personal in Christ. In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead somaticus bodily. You see that in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse number 8. For bodily exercise profited little. But godliness is profitable unto all things. Having promise of the life that now is. And of that which is to come. In other words, Christ is God explaining God. Christ is God explaining God by himself. And you will see how he handles things. Look at how Christ handles things. He will correct Job in natural disasters. Job said those disasters were from God. And then Jesus stands up and rebukes the storm. And rebukes the wind. Because he's not the author of it. So in rebuking the storm, he's correcting Job. That I was not the one behind the calamity that befell you. He corrects all the misconceptions. And the distortions of the Old Testament. You will see in Mark 4. He rebuked the wind and the storm. And there was great calm. The only part that God placed in the storm. Was to calm the storm. It was to calm the storm. When people were sick. He didn't say glory. I hear you have cancer. Glory. Heavenly father. Thy will be done. No. 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 There is no explanation from God when someone is sick apart from he heals the sick. 
People that hated Jesus touched him and they were healed. People that hated him, they touched him and they were healed. He healed one man. They say, who healed him? I said, I don't know whether he's a thief or a robber. But one thing I know, once I was blind, now I can see. All the people he healed were sinners. All these your Christian preachers who tell you 10 keys to healing is rubbish. Jesus healed sinners without a key. All the sinners he healed without a key. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Keys to healing. Where did you get it from? Steps to healing. Where? Doors. Shut up your mouth. If you don't know Jesus, come let's teach you. He healed his enemies. He blessed those that insulted him. He died for those who killed him. Deal with that. Deal with that. Deal with that. So in the Old Testament, there was no clarity. See, like that. So sickness and disease were from the enemy. But they put everything on God. But thank God for Jesus. There is light. And light exposes darkness. In the Old Testament, Satan was hidden in their ignorance. When Jesus showed up, he's the light that shines in darkness. And the darkness cannot comprehend it. That's why John will say in 1 John chapter 1 verse 5, This then is the message. Kabayada. This then is the message. Stand on your feet. Let's read it like a mass choir as I close this service. Are you blessed in this service? Let's read that scripture. Everybody like a mass choir. The radio audience wants to hear TV. Everybody wants to hear us. Let's go. One to go. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Glory to God. Hey, glory to God. 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 No darkness in him at all. God is absolute light. Absolute light. Those of you who are science science you know oriented here you know when you deal with the doctrine of absolute when a room is absolutely cold there's no iota of heat and when a room is absolutely hot there's no atom of cold god is absolute light absolute jacotama satan is absolute darkness jikobayada limon naketata listen god did not create darkness Darkness is an absence. The only thing God created is light. But when you reject his light, when he moves out, the absence of that light is darkness. And when God is out, the darkness is darkness. Bible says, how great is that darkness? God didn't create death. Death is an absence. When you reject God, and God goes as life, the absence of God will be death. Death is not created. Death is an absence. Darkness is not created. Darkness is an absence. Are we teaching here? Disease is not created. Disease is an absence. That's why when you are sick, they give you medication to fill up for what is missing. God only created light. Absolute light. Who da gada? Is the immortality that dwelleth in unapproachable light which no man has seen nor will ever see. He says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. And this light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. This is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The Lord gave a word into Jacob and it has lightened the house of Israel. Oh, house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light. For he that walketh in the light has no occasion of stumbling. The entrance of his word, it giveth light and it giveth understanding to the simple. That the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. 